students so up until previous class we learnt about uh, continuation of the uh, solution up to the up to the boundary that means uh, initially uh, when you uh, talk about existence of solution we only get the local existence then under some conditions uh, you can be able to obtain a uh, global solution as well so we uh, summarized uh, several theorems in the previous class and uh, basically uh, just to uh, give you a, a recapitulation of what we covered so we said that um, the solution will exist uh, globally that means uh, uh, you have an initial value problem uh, of this type so we have an initial value problem of this type dx dt is equals to uh, f of x t and uh, x at t0 is equals to uh, x0. So, this was our initial value problem. Let us call it as equation number 1. So, the solution, the first result that we summarized in the pre uh, that we mentioned in the previous class was the solution of this initial value problem, the solution of the initial value problem 1 um, exists globally, exists globally that means throughout the entire interval uh, uh, if the following condition if the following condition is known in advance is known in advance what is that condition so basically we are saying that uh, xt exists for some t that means the local existent exists local existence exists for some t uh, implies that norm of x t minus x 0 is less than or equal to g t uh, with g t greater than 0 of course because you are making norm less than or equal to g t so obviously g t has to be a positive uh, function so with g t greater than 0 a continuous function on a, a continuous function on r okay here of course it is dx dt and f uh, this f is a vector and then you have x as a vector and all that so um, you can do that so basically if uh, norm of x t minus x 0 if uh, that you can make it uh, less than or equal to some g t then uh, that g t is a positive function so then basically you will get a global solution and the second result that we summarized uh, or that we mentioned in the previous class was uh, if um, uh, the solution uh, the solution of the IVP 1 exists globally. globally if the vector field that means uh, our f if the vector field f is bounded what does that mean is bounded ie uh, norm of f over r cross rn or rn cross r since i am writing x first so it is better to write rn cross r so rn cross r is equals to some capital m which is less than infinity okay so the idea is very simple this uh, proof i think i have also shown that uh, you just take the norm x t minus x 0 and um, this will be your uh, norm of integral from t 0 to t we just integrate the equation number 1 and this will yield uh, uh, sorry this will yield our f of um, our f of uh, s uh, f of x s comma s uh, d of s norm and uh, this norm will basically go inside the integral so it will become less than or equal to and then you take the supremum or uh, the, uh, the 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 bound of this and uh, therefore it will become capital m and uh, we'll have uh, um, integral from t0 to t so this will be t minus t0 and uh, this is our basically gt so from previous theorem you can say that um, there exists a global solution right so 
having look i mean if we consider the ods um, this is th these are the steps you are following so if you have an ode first of all whether there exists a solution or not so once the existence is guaranteed that existence is locally now from locally we are going to globally in between we also have to make sure whether the solution is unique or you have more than one solution so just having the continuity of the right hand side will guarantee you existence of at least one solution and local solution now if you have right hand side as Lipschitz continuous which is basically our Picard's theorem then we have the unique solution right again locally now from there we move further and we check several properties that are these are basically the continuation of solution theorems which I mentioned out of which this one and two are also part of it um, which guarantees that the unique solution that we talked about whether it is global or not or whether you can extend it up to the boundary or not right so uh, several factors that are coming in when we are actually speaking of of the existence of solution right now from existence of solution and uh, uh, global solution we'll move further to something called dependence on the initial condition right dependent on the initial data and uh, today's lecture and probably the next lecture will be about uh, dependence on the initial value so it basically tells us that you have an initial value problem and you have an initial condition now if you deviate from the initial condition even a little bit then what will happen to the solution so you have xt0 equals to x0 initially now instead of xt0 equals to x0 you sort of put up the value by some small number so then how the solution will change um, whether your solution will still remain xt because you played with the initial value so the minute you played with the initial value um, whether the solution would still agree uh, to the actual solution or would it change if it changes how much it will change so that means there is a direct link between the solution and the initial data or the initial condition so here also i will uh, explain and i will mention two uh, one or two theorems which actually tells you that how uh, perturbing the initial data will change or will um, sort of give you um, uh, a different solution or uh, whether it will give you a same solution so those things we'll see now so let's move further all right so uh, dependence so today's article dependence on the initial data or the initial condition data or initial condition initial condition okay so suppose we have x um, has the solution of the initial value problem dx dt if it is not much of a trouble then I will prefer to write it as x dash equals to f of x comma t right and uh, x at t0 is equals to x0 right so clearly clearly let us write this as equation number one equation number two so clearly the solution x of initial value problem one to two depends on t obviously uh, then x0 and also f we can see very straight away right it's not so difficult to see you integrate both sides equation number one so you will integrate from t0 to t so it will become xt minus xt0 and on the right hand side we'll have t0 to t f of x uh, comma s d of s right so basically when you write xt then you bring x0 on the right hand side and then what will happen is x becomes a function of t obviously then it is depending upon x0 and also it is depending upon f so those observations can be made out very easily um, just looking at the 
equation itself. Okay. Now, um, here we want to investigate. So, we want to, we want to investigate, investigate xt and we want to investigate how xt, sorry, how, how xt uh, changes, changes with variations, variations in x0 and of course, f, right. Okay. We derive, we will derive or we derive uh, the upper bounds, the upper bounds for the distance between the solution of the perturbed, perturbed and the unperturbed. That means, first you disturb the initial condition and uh, the second one is the original initial condition. Unperturbed problems and we want to compare the solution of these two problems, unperturbed uh, problems, right. And um, here another point to be noted that we will derive all these estimates or all these uh, upper bounds for finite time interval. That means, we uh, let me put it in words the derivations or uh, the theorems, the derivations or the theorems, theorems are valid only for time interval interval t0 to t0 plus t for some capital T which is less than infinity. The reason is when you are studying the stability that means uh, how the solution behaves as t tends to infinity. So, when you are studying the stability of the uh, perturbed system when your capital T tends to infinity that is a different topic of discussion. So, that we will look into uh, in the, in the uh, future chapters. So, of course, it is part of the syllabus, but maybe later on. Uh, here we just want to see how the perturbed and unperturbed system behaves for a finite interval only because those things are also very important uh, when you are dealing with uh, numerical uh, simul uh, when you are doing the numerical simulations. So, there uh, you can change the you can perturb the initial condition and uh, from there if you have a finite interval you can see how much the deviation is there, how much error is there in your solution um, from the original solution that uh, that is the actual solution of your given uh, differential equation. So, here we will limit ourselves to finite time interval. In the next chapters, we will see what happens to our perturbed system when you actually make t tends to infinity, right. Now, uh, let us go to the next page. So, suppose uh, we have, uh, did I give a equation number? Okay, 1 and 2. So, next equation I can give 3 and 4. So, let us compare let us compare the solution of initial value problem 1 to 2 with the solution uh, solution uh, the solution x you can say x of initial value problem 1 to 2 with the solution y of the initial value problem given by. So, now we are perturbing the value given initial value. So, given by uh, dx dt or dy dt. Uh, let me erase it dy dt. 
So here whatever derivation I am going to do, I am perturbing the right hand side as well, but you can still do the same calculation without perturbing the right hand side, only perturbing the initial condition. I will show you I mean uh, at the end of this calculation that uh, you do not have to uh, do for f, but if you perturb right hand side as well, then uh, there will be a general result, right. So right now we are looking into the general result. So dy dt is uh, our f same right hand side f uh, y comma t you know, plus uh, let us say we perturbed it by f no? so let us use a different function so g of uh, y comma t and uh, i have perturbed the initial condition so now our y at t 0 so here t is greater than 0 but, and uh, here y at t 0 will be x 0 plus some uh, z0 okay so let's call it as equation number 3 this as equation number 4 assume that assume that f is lipstage that we do not want to disturb so lipstage continuity part is there lipstage continue lip is lipstage continuous lipstage continuous with the constant l as usual the way we have defined the Lipschitz continuity with the constant L. Then since your right hand side or uh, this f is actually Lipschitz continuous, uh, what will happen is we will have uh, x and uh, y they will both exist uniquely by the Picard's theorem. So, according to Picard's theorem if you have a uh, uh, Lipschitz continuous right hand side, so the solution will exist uniquely and uh, here you can write and the solution solutions uh, x t and uh, y t exists uniquely uniquely uh, on some time interval on some time interval because since the existence is local it will not be on the entire interval capital I right. So, it will be a subset of that. So, on some time interval um, subset of that will be t0 to some capital T which is the subset of I. Right? I is the original uh, time interval where the problem is defined, but since we are getting only local existence, but unique, um, we can say that uh, the small su subset of that uh, of that interval is t zero to capital T for some t positive. You can say for some capital T positive. Achha. Now we are interested in the a priori bound on the distance of x t and y t. How much did we deviate? If you um, if you have perturbed the system, that means if you have perturbed the right hand side, if you have perturbed the initial condition, then how much actually we are away from the original solution? That is very important to know, uh, at least uh, from numerical point of view as well when you are doing the simulation. So, uh, th there we are really interested in if you are perturbing the system or if you are computing the solution numerically, then how much error is there? So, here we want to find an upper bound of that uh, deviation of the solution x t from y t. So, that we will do in the following way. So, let us take, uh, let us, uh, so we want to, you can write, we want to, we want to know um, the upper bound, the upper bound of uh, x t minus y t or you can write y t minus x t since you will put norm anyways it will take care of that negative sign x t minus y t uh, upper bound uh, of x t minus y t or the distance or the distance of x t from y t right. So, let us take let us put z t is equals to y t minus x t. So, if I put z t equals to y t minus x t, uh, then the initial value problems, then the initial value problems 1 to 2 
and 3 to 4 uh, give what do they give they will give dyt minus uh, dt minus dx by dt so basically this is ddt of it will become zt is equals to we are substituting f of yt minus f of xt uh, plus g of uh, y g of y t ok. Uh, Let us go to the next page. Now, we can integrate both sides. So, if we integrate it will become z t is equals to z 0 plus integral from t 0 to t uh, we will have f of y s comma s minus f of x s comma s um, plus plus uh, g of y s comma s into d of s right. Now, for from this uh, we will take a norm on both sides. So, if we take the norm on both sides uh, uh, then this will be uh, if we take norm on both sides then this will be norm of z t is less than or equal to norm of z 0 we are using the triangles, triangles inequality right norm of uh, a plus b is less or equal to norm a plus norm b that is also valid for mod as well huh? mod of a plus b is less or equal to mod a plus mod b. So, here if you take the mod and if you treat this as a this as a and this as b. So, it will become norm of a plus norm of b. Now, that norm again will go inside then once it comes inside you have uh, again a plus b type situation where you treat this as a and this as b. So, then again you can apply triangles inequality and then this will become norm of this plus norm of this. So, I am going to write all these things in one step. Huh? It should not be confusing to you. Norm of f of y s comma s minus f of x s comma s norm plus norm g of y s comma s norm d of s. Um, now, uh, from here since our f is Lipschitz continuous we will get a Lipschitz constant. So, we will get norm of z 0 right plus l times norm of y s minus x s from Lipschitz continuity and uh, plus uh, norm of uh, this will become uh, t0 to t. So, here I have t0 to t um, norm of g y s comma s d of s. Now, this is our z t right. So, we will get uh, norm of z 0 plus l times uh, l times uh, integral from t 0 to t um, this is uh, z of s na? norm of z of s plus uh, norm of g y s s norm d of s. Now, here um, we have some kind of uh, uh, you can assume this as some g t. So, this we are defining we, got, we can call right hand side as g t. So, this is our g t because uh, once you integrate uh, uh, you put t, t s equals to t 0 and s equals to t and uh, this will actually give us um, our g t function. So, the right hand side uh, can be written as so therefore, this will imply uh, the right hand side of this inequality satisfies uh, let me the right hand side the right hand side of this inequality the right hand side of this inequality satisfies uh, g dot is less than or equal to l g plus norm of g y s 
uh, uh, let us not take g, uh, it might be confusing. Um, let us take uh, psi maybe, psi would be correct, huh? psi of t. So, this will be, uh, I can see because there is a g there. So, it is little confusing. So, I have psi uh, dot t is equals to l times uh, psi t plus norm of g y s comma s right. And uh, this is basically actually I mean uh, the, uh, this Gronwald's inequality here I have to put a norm here Gronwald's inequality that we covered in the I think previous class or one class before this uh, basically is the Gronwald's inequality in the integral form right. So, if you uh, if you uh, do the integration here then it will become psi t and uh, uh, basically um, this falls under achha, I have to write the initial condition also. So, psi at t 0 is equals to norm of z 0. So, this is uh, basically our um, uh, falling under uh, Gronwald's inequality and if you use the Gronwald's inequality then we write the a priori estimate as e to the power something and all that. So, that that actually comes from this equation. So, from this equation we are getting a very important theorem. Uh, let me write it here. If x t and y t be the solutions of um, of 1 and 2 and uh, it is perturbed problem uh, 3 and 4 3 and 4 respectively. respectively on some j is equals to t 0 to t, t 0 to t 0 plus capital T bracket close uh, and uh, f is Lipschitz continuous. Lipschitz continue f is Lipschitz continuous. Let me erase it. Uh, Lipschitz continuous continuous with Lipschitz constant L with Lipschitz constant L then for t belonging to j, we can use the Grunewald's inequality in the last equation that we derived and we can write norm of y t minus x t uh, is less than or equal to e to the power l t minus t 0 norm of y 0 minus of x 0 plus integral from t 0 to t, I have norm of g uh, y of s comma s e to the power l t minus s d of s. Let me just match the expression y t minus x t to power l t minus t 0 y 0 minus x 0 t 0 to t g of y s comma s e to the power l t minus s t s. And uh, if r is also bounded, if uh, g sorry if g is also bounded is also here you can put vector sign g is also bounded that is norm of g over r n cross r is less than some m for some constant constant m then here it will become further simpler y t minus x t is less than or equal to e to the power l t minus t 0 uh, y 0 minus of x 0 
plus uh, here it will become capital M. So, then it will be capital M T uh, e to the power capital M by L e to the power uh, L T minus T 0 minus 1 right. Uh, this is capital M. So, e to the power L uh, T minus uh, D s. So, 1 by L will come in the denominator and uh, therefore, this is correct yes. So, here we can see that the two we conclude the two solutions which are close at t equals to t 0 uh, may diverge exponentially however small the perturbations are and uh, the this this particular theorem actually tells you that if you uh, perturb the value even a little bit then basically this perturbation this uh, change in the initial condition and in the value of the function will actually bring uh, the, uh, this uh, di the, the divergence will be exponential I mean the, the solutions um, they will diverge basically from one another right and uh, this particular result with the help of previous calculation shows that um, our perturbation actually um, uh, bringing changes in the updated solution uh, of the updated equation basically. So, that means if you change the initial condition in your original equation then basically your solution will definitely uh, uh, be different or diverge from the original solution and uh, this is uh, valid for this finite interval for infinite interval that means when this t tends to infinity what will happen to that that we will come back later. But uh, this is the theorem that guarantees us that uh, how the uh, change in initial condition affects the solution. So, I will uh, stop here today and uh, I will continue our discussion maybe with one example uh, related to this in our uh, next class. So, thank you for attention.